Good morning, you guys. My name is Lori Boyer. Um, I'm on the board of directors for TMA, and I'm honored to be here with you guys. Uh, we're really excited about this advocacy training um, taking place today. So I'm just going to give you some information um, on the overall flow of the session. So um, the ladies here, they will be presenting, and then when they're done, I have a couple of questions that I'll be asking, you know, just generalized questions that might be helpful and answer some things for you. And then after that, we'll open it up to any questions that you might have along the way as well. Okay, um, so let's get a little bio here. Um, Kristen Engel is an Associate Director of Advocacy for the National Organization for Rare Diseases, known as NORD. Kristen oversees a Rare Action Network, RAN, which serves to connect and empower a unified network of individuals and organizations with tools, training, and resources to become effective advocates for rare diseases through national and state-based initiatives across the United States. So thank you for being here. Maria Knoll is a volunteer community engagement liaison for the NORD Minnesota Rare Action Network. She works alongside the Minnesota RAN State Ambassador to help the rare disease community in her state by advocating for better laws to protect rare disease patients and their families, as well as raising awareness for rare diseases throughout the state of Minnesota. So we're really excited to have you guys here today, and feel free to take some. Thank you for having me, uh, or us. <laughs> um, it's always great when I have a chance to, um, you know, work alongside some of our volunteers that work nationwide. So it's great to be in Minnesota, and be able to kind of bring Maria into the uh, activity today. So, um, as Larry mentioned, I'm with NORD National Organization for Rare Disorders, and the mission of NORD is that we are committed to treatments, cures, and uh, of rare disorders, and serving organizations that serve those patient communities, such as TMA. Um, we do this through education, advocacy programs, research, and patient assistance. A little quick history of NORD. In 1983, uh, prior to 1983, there was only five FDA-approved treatments for, a rare, for rare diseases. And Folks got together in a little town in Connecticut, New Fairfield, Connecticut, uh, who had who were either parents of patients or who were leading small patient organizations, and realized that there's a need for um, some legislation to help incentivize pharmaceutical companies to go into researching rare diseases because it's not a profit builder for them, um, so they had no interest at the time. There was no incentive for them to do that. Uh, in 1983, the Orphan Drug Act was passed. And what that entails is um, some different tax incentives for pharmaceutical companies to be able to go and research rare diseases. Um, they would get, at the time, it was 50% of their clinical trial costs back, um, as well as additional tax breaks and cuts, um, uh, even with the FDA approval process, it kind of moved them along. So um, it's been instrumental in rare disease research. Uh, it has benefited the rare disease community. I think currently today, I don't even know the most current number, but I'm gonna, I think it's like 700 or 800 uh, FDA approved treatments. And forgive me for not knowing that number. It changes daily, so, which is good. Um, it means we're going in the right direction. However, there's 7,000 rare diseases, so we're not even touching on how much research needs to be done and continue to do. So the Orphan Drug Act is, um, you know, NORD's history. It's how NORD was birthed. After the passing of this act, they realized that um, the rare disease community needed a louder voice. Individually, these patient organizations were representing small community members. And there was a need for an organization to bring all of those community members together. So at NORD, we like to say, alone you are rare, together we are strong. We work with patient organizations such as TMA and many others um, you know, through our membership platform, organizational development, but then on top of that, we also have opportunities for patient community to come in and do advocacy on a larger scale and represent your own disease, but also represent rare diseases as a whole. And we'll talk a little bit about that um, in, a few, in a little bit. So NORD represents 25 to 35 million Americans who are currently living with a rare disease. Um, the definition of a rare disease, is, I assume most of you know, is uh, less than 200,000 of the U.S. population, if it affects less than 200,000 of the U.S. population. Um, 7,000 rare diseases, as I mentioned earlier, 
and 90% of rare diseases do not have an FDA approved treatment. Um, so I first want to talk about our Rare Action Network program, which is the program that I oversee um, across our 50 states and Washington, D.C., and get to work with Maria on. Um, the Rare Action Network is a grassroots-based advocacy network, and it consists of members who sign up to become part of our network. And what that entails is they receive a monthly update from, from NORD, from the Rare Action Network, as to the ongoing, some of the policy initiatives we've been working on, um, also activities and events in the various states um, that are happening, and then any state-specific events, activities, or legislation, you would get emailed directly to you. So for example, if you're from Minnesota, you would get a Minnesota email anytime there's an activity or event happening um, in your state, uh, or any calls to action as well. Like write your senator, call your senator's office, visit your senator's office, um, any of those things. We developed a state ambassador program so as you can see from this map, this is where we currently have state ambassadors. The orange and blue are where we have state ambassadors in place. The white is where we are in need of some volunteer ambassadors. If anybody would be interested from those states, um, see me. <laughs> the difference between the blue and the uh, orange is simply uh, the orange represents our ambassadors are not only volunteering for the Rare Action Network, but they're also running a nonprofit patient organization for rare disease. So they kind of wear two hats in their, in their group and not uh, Erica Barnes, our ambassador here, is uh, the founder and president of Chloe's, Chloe's Fight Foundation, right? But <laughs> um, so that's kind of that, and I'm going to turn it to Maria to talk a little bit about, you know, her role as a community engagement liaison. Currently, we only no. do um, state-based po policy, federal policy, and state policy work. So as Kristen mentioned, my name is Maria. I'm a community engagement liaison here in Minnesota. Um, just to iterate, our state ambassador, Erica Barnes, is my partner who I directly support. She is actually not here today because she has an event for her foundation, Chloe's Fight Foundation. Um, so. <laughs> My experience working as community engagement liaison with NORD and with RAN um, began about a year ago. I learned about NORD after being uh, a fervent volunteer in other areas of the rare disorder community here in Minnesota, in uh, the Twin Cities specifically. I learned that there was an organization that existed that addressed or attempted to kind of bring together all of the rare disorder communities. And I thought that was pretty powerful. So I had been nested kind of advocating for specific communities. Um, and when I learned that uh, there's an organization that um, was well situated within its community, um, had a lot of resources and tools uh, for volunteers or advocates to uh, take advantage of, I knew I wanted to get involved because a lot of the foundation um, was already there. So I uh, took my place as a community engagement liaison, which means that I'm available for any community inquiry. So namely the state ambassadors working um, to head up the policy initiatives, and my main role is to kind of build our volunteer base. So on our uh, website, I'm listed as sort of a first point of contact. So I am available uh, in a volunteer capacity over email. I'm kind of responsible for checking that. Uh, every day, um, taking those, you know, those very few um, but very important inquiries from community members um, as they come in, um, getting those um, contacts from mothers, from parents, grandparents, anyone who's reaching out who's learned that there's an organization that exists that, like I said, has tools, has experience, um, has a lot of resources uh, for those patient groups to, to utilize. Um, I get those inquiries and I let them know a little bit about NORD. I let them know about the Rare Action Network as it's situated within NORD. Um, and I offer a time or, you know, an opportunity to meet with them face-to-face -face or over the phone uh, to, you know, share some more information about how NORD specifically um, can help either power their, you know, their individual start to a journey in rare disorder communities or their patient groups specifically. I feel like this is like a good luck charm or something. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, thank you, Maria. And uh, I can't thank her enough and all of our volunteers nationwide for the work they put in. They do it, you know, in their own time, and it can be time consuming. We know we ask a lot of our volunteers, but. Um, hopefully they find it rewarding. Um, we don't lose them very quickly, which is great. <laughs> That's a good sign that we're not overworking them. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, what is an actual advocate, uh, for those of you that don't know. But I always like to poll the room and see how many of you have ever met with your elected officials. Okay. So we got two people, which is great. Um, hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll all want to go meet with your elected officials. <laughs> well, well the, the issue might be that what if they don't want to meet with you? I mean, I've definitely written letters, but they don't, I, somehow they're too busy. Sure, and I can, I can certainly address that in, in ways to kind of push that too. So the definition of an advocate is a person who uses their voice to raise awareness and push for change. Um, you do not need to have any experience in advocacy. You do not need to have experience in public policy and legislation, as most people tend to think when they think, oh, advocacy and going to meet with my legislators, I don't do politics. You don't actually have to be an expert on any of that. You don't even really have to be familiar with it. What you bring to the table when you go to meet an elected official is your personal story and your personal struggles with caring for a rare disease patient or being a rare disease patient. and advocating for change to make it better for not only you but for future patients that come into your state or even on federal level um, you are welcome to like weigh in on policy matters it's you know nord is, is is nonpartisan, which means we don't you know we're not republican we're not democrat we work collectively with those that are in the in elected into office um, we can't, obviously, you know, we all have our opinions, but you have to check your opinions at the door to get anywhere with your legislators because they work for you whether you voted for them or not. <laughs> the role of advocacy really, um, you know, legislators want to hear from you. And I'll address, you know, what you had just said about having difficulty getting in touch with them. Um, to, to put it broadly you know what state are you from i can use an example ohio, ohio okay um in ohio is a pretty big state it's a decent sized state and those representatives and your representatives your legislators your your state and federal you know get hundreds of phone calls hundreds of emails you know a day thousands monthly um and they have to filter through all of those they do there is staff members in those offices that read every single email message um, I can attest to that. Everything does get read. It just may take some time, um, which not everybody has time if it's an urgent matter. Um, you know, they want to hear from you. If they don't know that there's a problem because they're facing all of these calls and inquiries from advocate from constituents all over their state or all over the country for that matter, you know, and they're they're not hearing about a rare disease specific issue that's affecting you, whether it be access to treatment, access to or denials on insurance claims or whatnot. Um, it can be very difficult for them to want to focus on those things. So this is where your story comes a very big, crucial part of that advocacy, working with your legislators to, to advocate for effective change. When you go to your legislator's office, you don't necessarily have to have a specific bill, like, oh, support HR 721, uh, you know, what you need is your story. You need to tell them that you are their constituent, you suffer from XYZ or you're caring for somebody with XYZ syndrome and then from there ask what you want from them if you're having issues with insurance you know go into their offices and say I keep getting denied for coverage for this I'm at my last resort believe it or not your federal senators offices all have um, on staff a health health aide they're all titled a health manager a caseworker um, but they all have them on staff and with those individuals, they can help navigate you to help you get past if you get insurance denial claims or you're having issues with your insurance or access to treatment or issues with Medicare, Medicaid. Um, those offices can actually help you along in, in kind of bypassing some of the issues in the, the denials that you're getting. Can't promise they work all the time, but they will work for you. And I encourage you if you're having those kind of issues, insurance or access issues, you know, to contact your your federal senator's office in, in your state because they all have those individuals, the health aides on staff, to be able to help manage that. Um, I'm going to actually pass it to, to, to kind of talk about your first experience working 
with um, a legislator walking into a legislator's office. As you saw, there's many people that have never done it, so kind of give your, your take on your first time you ever went to a legislator's office and what you did. So I have a few unique experiences. Um, first and foremost, I will debrief. I have not met with my legislator in their office, um, but I have a sort of out of the ordinary experience, which I'll couple with a very ordinary experience to kind of even it out. So um, some of the first ways that I've actually advocated, really gotten myself in touch with my representatives have been uh, in very subtle ways, as, Christian, or as Kristen alluded to. Um, using NORD as a tool that's available to any person in any state, or at least where um, we have some groundwork, you know, formed there, um, to get those email updates, those action alerts that she mentioned, um, for me to know what's going on to my legislator's plates, what's coming into uh, the legislative session that pertains to the rare disorder community, so that I could actually take advantage of those pre-prepared emails and simply plug in my name and my address and click a button and have that email that's been prepared by NORD sent directly to my legislator. Um, that was one of the very first ways that I engaged in advocacy, directly contacting them, and it felt like a seamless way to, to get started. It seemed like a very scary thing even to write uh, one of my representatives, and so having NORD there, um, you know, to just get that email, it shows up in my inbox, and all I have to do is plug in that information and be able to share it with friends and family members um, so easily. Um, that was one of the more, um, you know, kind of realistic and uh, replicative ways that I can continue to advocate. So that kind of evens out with my unique story, which is I haven't met with my legislator in person at their offices. I was actually um, representing Rand in a different capacity on the day that I had that opportunity. But I've actually had the opportunity to testify in front of our Health and Human Services Finance Committee here in Minnesota. Um, so I consider that my kind of outstanding example of meeting with my legislator. So um, uh, pertaining to some legislative work that we'll talk about later, uh, there was a bill that was about to be passed here in Minnesota this last legislative session. Um, myself, as a community engagement liaison, I joined our state ambassador, Erica Barnes, um, and we went to our um, state capitol. We arrived on the grounds uh, with some information from the legislative assistant that we had contacted previously. Um, we'd been in personal contact with them. Their information was available on our state website to know exactly the schedule of the legislative session. Um, we were able to get information from her about when to be ready. Um, it wasn't necessarily months in advance that we knew exactly the date and time that we were going to show up, but just like any other citizen, um, that is public knowledge of when those legislators are meeting and um, what's going to be on the agenda for that day. So by staying in constant contact with that legislative assistant, we were able to learn, okay, uh, the, the bill that we're interested in is going to be talked about in about two days at this time and we prepared ourselves to be at the Capitol on that day. Um, we learned which building it was in, simple as that, just again keeping track and email conversation with that staffer. Uh, and we were available for the whole period of time uh, that that specific, was, that specific committee was meeting. Um, so again, there was no big program, no manual, no menu of exactly what was going to occur, but really uh, those communications were taking place in real time. Um, and I was able to attend uh, that committee hearing where a large number of issues outside of healthcare were being heard. There were individuals from northern Minnesota who were down to talk about home care um, and a specific bill that was going through about home health aids. Um, there were environmental issues being discussed that day. I was so impressed and surprised to see how um, just you know, my regular community members were, you know, in the room with me. I thought everyone was going to be in suits, and uh, there were kids playing on the ground. There were uh, mothers with babies. Actually, that was one of the, the representatives there who was hearing uh, some of the issues that day. Um, so I got that unique chance to make my voice heard, um, share my perspective that was coming from my experience working in primary care clinics, intersecting with individuals um, who are you know, a part of our general population, sharing this with my legislators saying, you know, individuals in these communities are not rare. Um, 
when, when we're all considered together, there are so many of us. So I had, um, like I said, a very unique experience um, that was kind of scary, that was kind of broken down into a very just real process, you know, just a normal work day for those individuals um, with other citizens coming in to hear, have their voices heard. Thank you, Maria. So um, before I go into the next slide and talk a little bit about like overarching policy issues that you know, impact you as a rare disease patient or caregiver, um, I also want to emphasize you know, uh, just going to your legislator's office is not the only way to go about advocating and ad doing change. Um, currently, if you visited the rareaction.org site, um, you can A, sign up to become a member, which I encourage everybody to do so. Um, we don't solicit too much. We send out what's going on once a month, a few emails from NORD in regards to any upcoming events we're hosting. But overall, we'll also send out action alerts. So there's federal action alerts and then there's state-specific action alerts. But on our website, there's also a take action page that you can check daily, you know, weekly, however, monthly. Um, and there are calls to action listed there. Um, some of them are just click a button and send an email like Maria was talking about where you can personalize it with your personal connection to Rare um, and then send it off. Uh, it doesn't sound like, oh yeah, I'm sure those are you know, all the same letters, nobody's reading them. Uh, talking to some staffers recently in a senator's office, um, they assured us that they do read every email, but also they prioritize, obviously. They get so many inquiries and if they're getting five letters from somebody, like from a specific issue, it may go on the bottom of the priority list. If they get 100 letters on a specific issue, they put it to the top of the priority list because it's a louder voice. So regardless if it's, you think it's just this quick email, how is that ever gonna make change? It actually does. The more people that are sending those calls to action and sending those letters or calling, we have to call scripts sometimes if you feel comfortable calling your senator or representative, um, it all depends on the, the actual action item. It could just be to support a bill or oppose a bill or inform them of you know, the fact that you're a constituent with a rare disease and they need to take action on this issue. Um, what NORD does is when we decide what policy issues we're focusing on, on a national level and on a state level, um, we look at the common challenges of rare disease patients. And as you can see, uh, the average diagnosis time is five to, to seven years for an accurate diagnosis. Um, we've gone over the FDA approved treatments, which is about 90% of rare diseases do not have one. Extensive and long-term medical care and, and costs, the high costs of treatments, um, few medical experts on the disease, little research or, for, or anything known about the diseases, um, social isolation. So when you have a group, a small community of a rare disease population, there may be folks, and I've met many, and uh, maybe some in this room that had never met somebody with the same disease they had. That can be very isolating. Um, and it can cause a lot of mental health issues, um, depression, and that's a common thing amongst the rare disease community. Um, events like this patient conference are great ways to kind of you know, rid of that one area but these are issues that we address on policy-specific initiatives. Um, in small and scattered pa patient communities, prior to social media and the World Wide Web, uh, it was very difficult to connect with people with the same disorder that you're dealing with. So uh, social media has been a huge impact <coughs> on the way that people communicate with each other. You can connect to somebody in California if you're in Connecticut and you know, find out exactly like, hey, I have this disease and there's tons of groups and support systems out there. But you can also use social media as a tool to talk to your state and federal representatives as well. They're all on Twitter. And if they're not on Twitter, they're on Facebook. Um, but I highly encourage, if you, know, if you want to take it a step further, once you send a letter or to do a call to action on a rare action page, um, you know, tweet at them and say, hey, just sent you an email, hope you see it, you know, this is an important issue. Um, hashtags are always great, but when you tag and, and tweet out to these specific legislators, they're reading it. Um, and, and again, that adds to that voice. If they're seeing it on social media, they're getting it in their inbox, they're getting phone calls, it means you're actually drawing attention to that issue. So here's some things that you can do. 
sharing your story. Um, I saw on the agenda for this week's meeting uh, that there was a uh, story of uh, how to share your story. I um, hope some of you were able to attend that. Uh, that is a great, great uh, topic, and um, I think that you know your story is important. But there's an appropriate way to share your story, and then there's you know not that it's not appropriate, but there's things the elected official wants to hear, and then there's things they don't necessarily need to hear. Your story is unique. You've obviously been through hell and back with maybe diagnosis or access and things. They don't want to necessarily hear about every doctor's appointment you had in the last eight years. So you kind of got to bring it to a level where they're not going to tune out and fall asleep. Because <laughs> that can happen. Um, I was with an advocate once and, you know, in her mind it was very important to know, like, in 1982 I went to the doctors and went year after year until we got to 2008. Um, and they lost interest. So crafting your story is important. Um, if you attended that uh, session this morning or yesterday, I'm sure that you learned a lot of useful tips. On our Rare Action site, there's an educational tools part. There's also some educational tools and videos on how to, how to write your story, how to share it appropriately. Meet with your legislators. You don't have to have an ask. You don't have to, you know, even, you want to build a relationship. Everybody should build a relationship with their legislators. The reason why is because if your legislators don't know what a rare disease is, you'd be surprised. Many of them don't even know that term. Um, and once you define to them what a rare disease is and that you're a constituent with a rare disease, they start bringing attention to that and they start, well, how can I help you? What do you need done? Um, getting involved in your community. Your, many legislators host like coffee time and in in like your own communities. You can go to the capital. I mean, I get to travel the country and see a lot of capitals, and they're all beautiful. <laughs> so, it, it, you know, definitely, if you've never been to your state capital, I encourage you to attend, even just take a tour. Um, but I, it's it's important that you're sharing your story. You're not there to be an expert on a bill, even if nor is sending you an email saying support HR 721, write a letter to your you know, senator. You can certainly research what you're doing, and I encourage you to kind of take a look at the bill. Some bills are like 97 pages. I mean, who's got time for that, really? <laughs> so Nord's policy staff, for example, you know, they handle the ins and outs, the details of the bill. They make sure that it's an appropriate bill and it impacts in a positive way the, the rare disease community. We need you guys to step up and start using your story and your voice because there's many out there that aren't able to use their voice. Um, and many that are not able to go to a state capital. They either live too far or you know, they're just, they can't physically. So we need those that are willing and able to speak on their behalfs as well. Um, it doesn't have to be just patients, caregivers, family members, friends. Um, anybody connected to RARE in any way is welcome. We welcome all stakeholders to all of our advocacy events and activities, including industry people, physicians, nurses, really all stakeholders, because everybody has a say in, in how to improve lives of our disease patients. And do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, what they, like kind of what you've done here in Minnesota to give an example of some of the rare action network uh, programs that you did see a state that has an ambassador, you know, I'm certainly happy to connect you to that ambassador. But Maria will talk a little bit about what she does here as an example um, in Minnesota. Thank you. Great. So here in Minnesota, and like Kristen said, you know, probably in your state, if you saw some of the colors on that board, or maybe in your state in the future, uh, some of the things that we engage in, uh, first and foremost, we have monthly meetings. So. Um, one of the you know difficulties you know bridging gaps between different rare disorder communities is just knowing uh, that we can all come together you know we're all kind of in our individual niches and so those monthly meetings are great opportunities for individuals in Minnesota to learn that um, they can have even more advocates and allies beyond their own patient groups uh, one of the ways we've started to do that is actually a virtual call-in. We used to meet every month in person, but we began to learn very quickly the limitations, you know, physical limitations, time, kids, uh, distance, you name it. So we host monthly call-ins. We actually use um, the line and video that Nord is able to provide to us. So we don't have to worry about Skype or if our phones are going to accommodate it, what have you. Um, we're able to uh, send a, an email blast out and post on Facebook letting individuals, groups know we're going to have this call-in and all are welcome to join. 
and it can accommodate uh, about as many as uh, would probably attend. So it, we don't reach any limit for sure. That's, we don't have hundreds of thousands of people on the call. Um, so that being said, that monthly call-in is a very um, unique opportunity for people to just have conversation in real time across groups uh, and with individuals they've already been working with. Uh, those monthly meetings are also times for us to learn about what's important to us across the different groups to talk about you know the work we want to do uh, events and opportunities that are coming up um, one of the ways we're utilizing our monthly meeting right now is actually to have um, specific guided topics so each month um, we're having not necessarily experts but kind of you know topic experts coming in and talking about um, an issue or um, some sort of domain that's relevant to rare disorder communities. Um, we had a discussion about newborn screening uh, not too long ago, and we had a sort of expert coming in from the public health department on that. Uh, some of the other things that we do through RAN include um, attending health fairs. I've been to this location before because the Minnesota Public Health Nurses Association has their annual conference here. Um, so we've been able to table at that event, get the word out within um, professional organizations. As I'm sure many of you know, there's, where there's a nurses association, there's a physical therapist association, there's physician associations. So the options are kind of limitless for uh, engaging with um, a wide variety of professionals in a professional setting. Um, we also go out to more local events. So like I mentioned before, um, I'm actually going to be going tonight to this um, this 5K that's happening for the Chloe Spite Foundation. It's being hosted as a larger, as a part of a larger event that's going on in the Greek community here in the Twin Cities. Uh, so that's an exciting opportunity for RAN, the Rare Action Network, to be seen um, in a setting that's you know set aside for a rare disorder cause, but is also you know it's inviting in a whole diverse population of people in the metro area. Uh, so uh, those gatherings. Um, health fairs, professional association, uh, engagement opportunities, and then opportunities engaging with larger institutions like our universities that are around and um, some of the various uh, other organizations. Uh, I'm gonna turn it back over to Kristen now. Thank you. Um, so this is just a slide of our lovely slogan. <laughs> Um, and some of our advocate, well, that was race that we did for rare diseases, but this uh, picture on the right is actually a photo of when we had a Hill Day a couple years back in D.C. And uh, the orphan drug tax credit was actually at risk through a tax uh, legislation that was kind of buried in about 300 pages of legislation, and there was this little tiny thing about the orphan drug tax credit being eliminated. Um, we advocated on Capitol Hill down in D.C. with patients and, and family members, um, and successfully they did not eliminate it. Uh, they did they did cut it in half. So it used to be 50% of clinical trial costs to get back. Uh, now it's 25%. So at least they didn't eradicate it, uh, but we're working to protect it, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So kind of diving into what our policy issues are. Um, the federal policy, you know, we work on a lot of stuff. Obviously, federal policy has been a part of NORD since the very beginning. Um, this year, we specifically worked on supporting the Orphan Drug Act. It's not currently in jeopardy, but there's been a lot of talk, you know, in the administration that it could potentially be on the chopping block once again. So if we're ensuring, we're kind of getting ahead of that and trying to uh, work with state and uh, our federal senators in various states to identify rare champions. And people that will commit, these, these senators and representatives will commit to, you know, if the Orphan Drug Act does come up for conversation to be eradicated, that they will, they will support it, they will oppose any kind of legislation that could uh, put it in jeopardy. So we want to make sure that it does not get destabilized um, and it stays as is because it is very important to the rare disease community for those that don't currently have a treatment. And for those that do have an FDA approved treatment, um, you know, most likely it was beneficial because of the Orphan Drug Act. So we want to, con to continue that, men that mentality. Um, Newborn Screening Saves Live Act was recently uh, approved in July in the House. Uh, and that is simply uh, funding and some uh, programs that, uh, that, that the recommended uni uniform 
Screening panel. Screening panel. I always mess up. I call it RUSP, but you wouldn't have known what I was talking about because I said RUSP. Uh, and that program pretty much recommends on a federal level the newborn tests that are taken when a baby is born with the little heel prick that they all have. Um, NORD has been a huge advocate for newborn screening because there's many rare genetic disorders that can be tested for at birth. So this reauthorization act was passed in the House in July and it's currently uh, was introduced to the Senate in July. So it's still you know going through the processes. Um, I believe we have a call to action on our rareaction.org website as well uh, that you can send a letter to your uh, senator's offices to support that legislation. Um, the Medical Nutrition Equity Act is for medical foods. Uh, insurance companies don't like to cover the cost of medical foods and that's usually TPN or tube feeds uh, that you may know folks and they need it to survive you know, battling with their disease. Um, but unfortunately, many insurance companies and even some Medicaid uh, in different states don't cover that fully. So the Medical Nutrition Equity Act ensures that rare disease patients do have access to the needed, whether it be formulas or the, um, the tube feed foods, because uh, they don't see it as a medication even though it is an actual treatment for their disease. And of course on a federal level we're always looking for ways to make sure that you know, there's affordable access for patients and their families. We also have, uh, and we recently have worked with um, patient advocates to kind of learn what some of their struggles with their insurance companies have been. Um, we all know there's various ways to, to talk about um, issues that you face with step therapy. I know that in this community, I believe that's something that you guys, some, some folks have faced uh, significantly is step therapy. And if you don't know what that is, that is when um, a physician prescribes a medication or treatment and your insurance company comes back and says, well, that's an expensive treatment, so you're going to have to try A and B first, fail on them, then you can get that one. Well, in the rare disease case, the physicians typically know that A and B aren't going to work. So what we are asking of the federal government and in states is that there are step therapy restrictions. Now, in certain cases, that could be, you know, a great, you know, we don't oppose it altogether. Step therapy is a great money, money saver for certain things, more common illnesses and whatnot. But in the rare disease space, usually the doctors know what they're prescribing is going to work. And in some instances, if they do have to go off and go on the A drug and then the B drug, it could be life altering, life threatening, um, you know, could be very dangerous in terms of, of these treatments. So we're making sure that patients do have appropriate access to those treatments and not have to do you know, fail those two other uh, levels before they can actually access the appropriate treatment. Um, we do that, as I said, on a federal and state level. <laughs> Excuse me. Our state policy issues. So a lot of the things overlap. You'll see newborn screening, step therapy. There are many issues that are both on the federal and state level. Um, but in state policy for NORD, we put out each year a state report card for every state. And what that entails is it grades the states on specific initiatives that we focused on for that previous year. So currently, the 2018 report cards are available on the state's websites. And as you can see at the bottom, if you want your state's report card, you can go to rare and your state's initials.org. Anybody from Georgia in here? Because <laughs> that's the only one that you have to spell out. <laughs> uh, but if you go so raremn.org from Minnesota, you can download the state report card. Um, and see where the state, you know, has done great in, and then where the state has, uh, you know, not done so great. We use this as a tool when talking to elected officials in the states and say, hey, look, you guys did great on medical nutrition. You know, we're above par with other parts of the country. However, in, you know, out-of-pocket cost sharing, which is, you know, a percentage of your, cover, of your medications are covered by insurance and then you have to pay the difference, well, with rare disease drugs, as you all know, they're very expensive, and that could be you know thousands of dollars for a patient per month. So we look for legislation in the states to cap the copays. Um, I believe New York is a great example. They have legislation in place where a patient doesn't pay more than $100 a month per medication, regardless of what the medication is. Um, not many states have that legislation yet, um, but that is something that we have been pushing. Our, our wonderful RAND volunteers have been really helping in endorsing that in their states, especially if there is legislation that needs. I know I'm from Connecticut, I know they've been trying to pass it for years now, and Massachusetts as well. 
uh, but it's still on the on the table and we're still sending advocates to the Hill every day to talk about it and talk how it affects them and impacts their lives. So, um, some other topics that we have, uh, Medicaid, obviously we want to make sure that Medicaid expansion is important in all the states, so we push for that um, specifically. And the last one is Rare Disease Advisory Council. So we currently have, I believe it's nine states, or eight states that have what is referred to as a rare disease advisory council. And each state is unique as to how it's set up. But what our overarching view of a rare disease advisory council was when we first started pushing these out to the states is it's all stakeholders come to the table. So you have patients, caregivers, uh, parents of a child with a rare disease, a physician that treats rare disease patients, nurses, or any medical specialists that, that you know treat or, or physical therapy, um, also industry representatives, and then state legislators to join these councils. They're, run, they're usually appointed by the governor of the state, um, and they're run specifically to advise on any legislation that could impact the rare disease community in that state. Um, and as I mentioned, it's very unique for each state, uh, and I'm going to actually turn it to Maria in a second to talk about what they just did in Minnesota, and they've been working on it for three years? I think it's been three or four years, uh, and uh, excited that they just passed it. But it was, it's very unique here in Minnesota as well because it actually became a budget item, and I'll let Maria kind of dive into that for a few minutes. But these councils are really important, um, and you know we just saw in Kentucky. I was actually in Kentucky a few weeks ago for the governor's signing of the Emergencies Advisory Council there, and um, you know they're important. They're they're being a voice at the state level for all of you to make ensure that you guys have access and there's no um, impending legislation that could impact you directly. So hang on, Maria. So as Kristen mentioned, the Rare Disease Advisory Council in Minnesota did pass. Uh, this card was put out, you'll see it says incomplete there, it's complete. Um, the legislative session it passed during was just this past spring. Uh, as Kristen mentioned, it took a long time uh, to get that bill passed and uh, I'm going to have to credit our state ambassador, Erica Barnes, for uh, doing all of the work for the advisory council. Um, I joined Rare Action Network um, a year ago, and I was hot on the heels of their first go-around. Uh, Erica and coalition members had just um, attempted to get it passed during the legislative session. Uh, it did get through a few hoops and over a few obstacles, but ultimately uh, did not make it through. So this was the second time taking it into the legislative session this past spring. Um, the advisory council, um, as a bill, came to mind uh, when Erica, a mother of a child whom she lost to a rare disease, um, thought to herself, you know, how can we, uh, how can I take what's happened to me in my life and, you know, as an able advocate, how can I turn that into change? And how can I turn that into change for more than just my patient organization? Um, she began having conversations with friends and family members, people who she knew through her daughter's journey, um, physicians, uh, different patient organizations. She turned those conversations into partnerships where she began to meet with them regularly to identify, you know, what is this, this problem that we're trying to address? There's so many different things. Um, that we could do when it comes to rare disorders. How can we distill it down to a topic that we can talk about? Uh, and ultimately, through those conversations, you know, she and her partners identified uh, a way to address all of the common barriers that are faced across the different disorders. That as an encapsulated problem. Um, and ultimately, uh, coming up with the bill as a sort of encapsulated solution or a path to a solution. So having um, the ability to organize or assemble key stakeholders to have a dialogue about these common barriers that are faced across the different communities um, and come up with meaningful ideas for how to start working towards solutions. Um, so like I said, ultimately those started through real life conversations and partnerships. Erica turned those partnerships into a sort of coalition by reaching out to different patient organizations, reaching out to institutions, so the medical institutions in the area, the academic institutions where research was being done, where she knew that there were um, people in high positions.
politicians who have vested interest in that. Um, reaching out to members of different medical organizations, like I alluded to, physical therapy associations, nurses associations, um, and ultimately uh, bringing together those patient groups um, through sort of formalized partnerships. So um, not just, you know, Erica as the individual having that relationship, but really tying together those different organiza organizations, getting the leukodystrophy community to talk to uh, the ALS community and what have you. Uh, next, she had to learn how a bill even became law. She had this great idea and uh, her different partners um, were in on it. They wanted to take it to an advocacy level. Um, but ultimately, she needed to learn that process. She, by training, is a speech and language hearing pathologist, so she um, doesn't have experience with politics. Uh, she looked to Nord uh, for those tools. Um, that information is available to all of you on Nord's website. Um, different pieces on how to uh, just understand the government structure. Uh, it's been a long time since some of us have taken government or history. Um, information on how to contact your legislators um, and what it would look like if uh, a piece of legislation actually had to go through the legislative process. That information is also available on all of your state websites. Um, from there, uh, she needed to, with her coalition members, so members of those associations, key stakeholders and in various institutions, needed to start approaching her representatives. Um, so each of those stakeholders identified their individual representatives based on where they lived um, and also where they worked um, because, you know, some of those people are driving in from far away, so it's key to remember that you are a constituent based on where you live. Um, and they started reaching out to those individuals to just get to know them. As Kristen mentioned, um, that started as a conversation with those uh, representatives, you know, hi, I'm so-and-so, and I have these other individuals who are key stakeholders in this community where we have this common interest in making a difference and starting some sort of change here. What does that look like to you? How could we get that going? Meeting with those representatives over and over just to have those conversations before even having any sort of bill in mind. Um, because ultimately the next step was identifying uh, those uh, senators or representatives who are going to be key authors. So after those partnerships, after those relationships were solidified, um, those stakeholders were able to have that conversation, you know, taking it to those, to those legislators and asking, would you be willing to, you know, own this change? Would you be willing to author this bill? Would you be willing to make this a priority this next legislative session? Um, and they were able to do that by really, uh, you know, keying in on uh, rare disorders that have affected those legislators. So asking them, you know, can you think of someone in your life who's had um, ALS? Can you think of someone in your life who's had uh, a genetic disorder? Um, and ultimately, those were the conversations that really solidified those those authors as you know, joining the team. So from there, ultimately, um, they had to learn about the logistics of. Um, bringing a bill into, um, into legislative session. They brought stakeholders together time and again to be a part of the process for developing that language that was going to go into that policy so that it was reflective of all of the different interests of patients, family members, caregivers, providers, um, so that it wasn't just being written by those legislators uh, or by any one individual uh, alone. Um, after that language was developed and they learned about the logistics about how the bill is going to become law and who of those different stakeholders is going to need to be present at each of those different steps along the way, um, we were able to, this is kind of where I, I come in, <laughs> it's very late in the game, um, we were able to start raising awareness, you know, um, bringing the Rare Disease Advisory Council as this novel idea into the news media, um, getting them uh, you know, making them aware that, that something was, was coming, it wasn't, you know, it hasn't yet passed. Um, having Erica go on to the news and actually share her story uh, and really frame where this piece of legislation is coming from. Uh, and then making it a point of topic to discuss at, at those uh, health fairs or different association meetings. Ultimately rounding out that experience with um, activating different community members, having them uh, 
click those buttons, put their name in with those action alerts when they finally started to mention the advisory council bill um, and having individuals uh, start attend uh, committee meetings to, to testify and share their story in person. Um, and those are the, the steps that ultimately led up to um, passing the bill. It wasn't easy and it was a lot of, um, there was a lot of real-time relationships that made it possible. Um, but that's really where we find ourselves all so capable of making change because it doesn't take having a high status and it doesn't take knowing politics in and out. It just takes uh, investing some time and getting to know uh, different members of your community and bringing them all together. Great, thank you. And that was a great example. And like I said, in every state, it's a little bit run differently. And um, I'll just kind of tap on to, you know, in Connecticut, where I'm from, they had a task force pass. So that was to assess the needs of the rare disease community in the state. It had an expiration and it expired um, last October. And a report is currently being published on their findings. But I went to those meetings regularly as a constituent um, caregiver, but also as a NORD representative. And uh, it was kind of comical to go into a room where there's all these state agencies represented and we have patients represented. And there was two state agencies that one was like, I guess maybe a housing assistance and one was a disability assistance that didn't know each other existed. And they're both state agencies. <laughs> and until we got them in the room, they realized their clients could benefit from each of those agencies. So there's definitely work to be done in the states in connecting those. You know, you think, oh, well, it's a Connecticut government agency. You all know each other. And apparently they don't. And I learned that firsthand. So these advisory councils and any of this legislation really helps dive into those issues and address what else is going on in the state. Um, and I think we're at the questions point. Perfect. So just to kind of summarize, um, you guys are mentioning go to rareaction.org and register so you can get the latest updates in regards to what's going on in your state and you know peruse that information uh, in order to take further action. Um, in addition, you get that state report card um, from your rare.state.org. Um, tell me this though, a couple of things. It, depending on whatever state you're at, if I go to rareaction.org, can I then find my representative um, my RAN representative, is that how I would find that information, or how do I find out on my state level who I can Sure. To? So if you visit, like, for example, rarenn.org, at the top right corner, it will have uh, Maria's photo and Erica's photo and their email address. Um, if there is not a state ambassador in that state, it will there will be a little grayed out profile picture that says, we need a state ambassador here. Um, we have representatives across, we have members across all 50 states. So even if there's not an ambassador in the state currently, you know, you still get action alerts, you still get information. We just don't have somebody currently being that liaison between the state and NORD. So we're not as active in those states currently. Thank you. So how do I make sure if I'm starting off on this advocacy journey and I'd like to make an impact, how do I make sure that my status is a priority for research funding and insurance coverage? What do you think would be the best steps to take? I think the best step is to craft your story, practice your story, do it in front of a mirror, do it in front of your loved ones. Um, you know, I, I always refer back to what's called an elevator pitch. Um, it's an old sales thing and, you know, Legislators are busy, and even though if you schedule time with them and get a meeting with them, um, they may walk in and say, well, I've got five minutes, uh, or I've got three minutes, come ride with me in the elevator. So get your story together. You know, you can have your 10-minute version, but then narrow it down to a 60-second, minute-and-a-half version. Um, we have tools on the website on how to do that, um, and make sure your ask is clear, but your story is important. If you bring awareness to my site, then will follow the, the research, will follow the legislation to impact and increase funding. Um, sorry. And then uh, you, you certainly want to make sure that um, if you're meeting with your legislators that you know, you're not only talking about your specific needs, but also the needs of the patient community you represent. You, know, you may be in there talking about what impacts you, but let them know, I'm not the only one this is impacting. This is impacting you know, a number of people. Legislators love numbers. And when you take a rare disease community and say, I don't know why my phone is doing that, sorry. Um, when you take a uh, rare disease community in partial, it's a small community. And then they're going to say, well, how many people in this state actually have this disease? Could be 10, could be 100. That's not a number that they're interested in. 
But when you take the population of your state and you take 10% of that number, so for example in Connecticut, we have 3 million uh, Connecticut residents, approximately 300,000 have a rare disease. That is an interesting number that they say they kind of perk up because that's 300,000 constituents. So. I'm just going to open it up if you guys have questions, I'll bring them around. You know, a meeting, or requesting a meeting with a legislator, I mean, meeting with a, an assistant, is that just as good Absolutely. as a meeting with a legislator, him or herself? Yes, and that's a good question. I usually actually mention that, and I did not, so I apologize. Um, yes, many times, if you don't get the legislator, chances are getting a legislator is really rare. <laughs> Uh, meeting with their staff is actually sometimes better. Um, I like to say that the staff is the neck of the, of the, of the office. They actually turn the legislator's head to attention to, to issues. So when you meet with staff members, it's just as important. Um, and, you know, if not more, because they're the ones that's going to put it in front of that legislator and say, this is an issue that you need to address. Um, you know, don't be frustrated if you call and maybe you have six meetings throughout the year or whatnot, and you know, you only get the staff person, it's not the worst thing in the world. But if you continue that relationship, eventually you will meet that legislator, and they'll be very familiar with your issue. Questions? Okay. Well, uh, U.S. Senators and Congressmen have offices, maybe they have, like in Indiana, they have, uh, I don't know how many different offices in different cities. And, you know, going to Washington is about impossible for me to do anymore, but uh, visiting my state office for that Congressman or Senator, is that just as good as well? Absolutely, absolutely. So the, when you're talking about your Congressman or your Senator's offices, you're in their in districts. Um, it's just as important. They have different staff that manages the, the in-district offices, but um, we've been bringing advocates uh, just this past summer to specific legislative offices in district to meet with their legislators to talk about the Orphan Drug Act. And uh, you know, then come October when we have our annual summit in D.C., we're going to be bringing them to D.C. to meet with those staff members, and they're different. And so I definitely encourage developing those relationships with, even with the district staff members too. Because um, they can also connect you to the folks in D.C. and you even have a conference call. You know, you don't necessarily have to physically be in the room to connect with your legislator. Um. I can't remember what your name is. Maria. Maria, is this a full-time job for you? <laughs> uh, not for me. It had been a full-time job for Erica, the state ambassador I've been alluding to. So um, I'll get to me in a second. But so Erica, just to speak to the whole full-time job feeling that you're getting here, uh, she did take a year off of her work in order to pass the bill with the second go-around. Um, a lot of what she did, she did alone. It means that you don't necessarily have to take a year off work if you're able to delegate. Uh, and rely on those people that you delegate out to. Um, Erica is an outlier in that she had the time and the capacity to do it, uh, to do a lot of that relationship building on her own. So um, there's there's good things and bad things about that, uh, but certainly, you know, she, we acknowledge, is, is a super outlier. But there are rare disease advisory councils that have been passed in plenty of other states. Um, and so there's a lot of room to learn from how those individuals and groups got that, that work done. Um, myself specifically, I happen to work in a field that um, really holds up volunteering. Um, so I actually have been able to um, get time off or take personal time in order to attend uh, some of these events. When I've gone out to DC, I was able to get that paid as educational pay because I work in healthcare. Um, so getting creative about how to talk to your employer, um, that is what's made it possible for me to do the work that I do. Um, I'm also, um, I'm, you know, only a few years out of my undergraduate, so um, I do have a lot of the capacity to, um, to invest a lot of time in, in what I'm doing here. So kind of like what Kristen said, and this is kind of my driving motto, is, you know, if I'm, if I'm one of the few who is capable and willing um, I'm going to go ahead and do it because there's so many people who, who aren't, who don't have the time or who have kids or 
who aren't able to leave the house. Um, so there's certainly a kind of a dual relationships and ways you can engage there. I'm just going to add to that really quick because I just want to clarify. So Erica did not, we did not ask Erica to take a year off of work. She got a grant for continuing education that allowed her to do that. And part of that grant was she described that she would be doing work for Nord. So that was completely, we have many state ambassadors that work full time. Actually, most of them do work full time, but they do have flexibility when we have a one o'clock conference call or, you know, if we do ask them to go to the Capitol. So I just wanted to clarify. It's a, being an ambassador is about four to six hours a month, but yes, it does get busy, and there, there's always work to be done, and it was great Eric was able to do that. I think the takeaway there is just knowing that, you know, whatever answer you get the first time around from someone, you can always revisit it, you know, depending, you know, how you're asking for time off or how you're going to make that extra uh, piece possible. It's an ongoing conversation, and people are, are usually willing to, to try to help so if I went to a, um, something to advocate, I'm a patient, but I don't have a problem with insurance because I've got good insurance. But if I'm trying to advocate for those who don't, I don't feel like my story would, would be beneficial for that necessarily. So how would I be able to bring a story to them if I can't get the people to get there? Sure. I mean, you can, we have our ambassadors collect stories all the time and our volunteers, you know, they collect still patient stories and they represent those patients when they're not there. That's kind of how that works. And your story is still important. They still want to hear you're connected to the, 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 the disease state or the rare community. Um, and you may not personally have issues, but you know somebody that does. I know we've yes, For sake of time, um, we're going to have to end the session now because we don't want you guys to get hangry because it is lunchtime. Um, <laughs> But we just want to thank him so much for being here uh, you know, and answering some questions for us and giving us some insight into advocacy. And please take a moment to fill out the conference evaluation. If you don't mind putting in the basket on your way out, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.